you can see how all these things I've said before come into play in turnout. So as we know, turnout has been, or lack of control of turnout, has been associated with the onset of injury in a number of occasions. Um, and it's fairly well documented out there, particularly in terms of Vicky Davis's work um, that she did in 2005. Um, and some of the different compensatory techniques we see in relation to turnout, we see people losing in t to try and get their full external rotation. Um, they tend to pronate through the feet. We see increased tibial torsion, so they wind up from the knees. Remembering that the tibia has to externally rotate a little bit in order to maintain turnout, however they're using too much of it. Um, and we also see a lot of anterior pelvic tilt coming into play, so they stick their bottoms out, thinking that this is going to allow more movement in their hips, but it actually does the opposite instead. Transfer of weight comes into play as well when we're looking at this. So, and I've taken it very, very simply here, but with the idea of transfer of weight being bringing the centre of mass over base of support to, to sustain balance. Um, transfer of weight is something that in order to really be safe in the execution of our dance technique, we need to have got some idea of this, but you can imagine when we combine our adolescent dancer and those changes that are happening there, with their sense of bringing their weight over a standing leg and in the dynamic control that's needed there, we could be starting to open up some different forces acting on the leg, which could, which could have added to the cause of this injury. So coming back to our case study, looking at the treatment and management. So very simply, the early part was very standard by the books, nothing special. Um, it, we did standard range of motion and, and strengthening program, um, incorporating soft tissue massage, dry needling, joint mobilisations, various range of motion and strengthening exercise, proprioception exercises for home. But the most important thing we did on this first occasion was educating this dancer. Remember, she was terrified. So in terms of the education, I first went through, we described we described the anatomy of the area. We discussed about what was happening there and I gave her an idea of what her name was. And she was quite, she was quite fearful about it. We then, she was in this big knee brace. Luckily they'd actually bought a bag of three different smaller knee braces with them so that I could choose which one that she needed. Um, and we put her into a patella stabiliser brace instead so that she thought for the next couple of weeks had a little bit of feedback around her knee. We also spoke timelines and got, got a realistic idea of how long things would take. And in terms of, from her, I started speaking to her about what she had coming up in her huge, huge timetable of things. Um, and two of the things she had was a grade seven ballet exam and an intermediate ballet exam. And they were the two things she was dead set on doing that year. It was March, they were in October, November. So it gave us a realistic period of time to work with there. So we started setting some goals in relation to that. And actually, her biggest home exercise or homework to do that day was to go home and write down goals um, using the kind of smart goal idea there. And then we started with communication. Communication, I think, is the thing that worked in this. Everything else was pretty by the book, but communication is where things really work. So obviously, I got her consent to do it. But then we went into, I spoke to her about the teachers, and the aim was to get her back into the studio as soon as possible. And we had her in the studio the very next day, working on her home exercises at that time, but so she was in the environment with her class and doing things with people that she normally worked with and feeling like it was an achievable goal to get back to it. I was lucky that the school that it was, I was in close communication with anyway, and so I could speak to them quite, quite easily and quite openly about where things were at. And this worked really well. And she actually, she hardly missed a dance class after that evening. She just went and did her squats and things like that. But she sat, she took notes, she learned everything. She used visualisation. And these are all things we spoke about at that initial point. So two weeks later, her, she had achieved full act range of motion. She was still walking a bit funny, but as soon as we took the brace off, that actually disappeared. Um, at three and a half weeks, she started jumping on the reformer. And four weeks, she started landing jumps from, from um, like stepping down off a small step and landing. At five weeks, she had a specialist review and he was really happy and said, we don't need to go down the surgical route. They still questioned that when they came back and saw me, but we put our trust in him there. And we put our trust in how far she'd come in that period of time. Um, so I'm just gonna go 
going very briefly through a couple of the exercises that we went through with her, and this could take an hour and stuff. But we went through a squat progression. So we started with mini squats. We worked that into bigger squats. We brought that into lunges, into um, single leg squats, and then we worked in turned out positions there. Everything we did, we did in parallel before coming into turn out so that she could get the control there. Really interesting teaching dance for a squat because when you first ask them to do it, they just bend forwards and teaching them to stick their butt out behind them is a bit of a mind blow, as I'm sure some of you know. Um, we, we did a play on the star excursion balance test, so where they're standing on one leg and they're having to move the other leg around and control their balance throughout that, and we found that was really good. Um, and we used Mary Jane Lederbeck's ideas of her aeroplane exercises and her progressions with that, and that's worth reading up on if you get a chance. Did a lot of work on the reformer, including um, jump landings, was the biggest thing to get her confidence on her leg. Did a lot of adduct work and lunges. And we did some plyometrics as well, so various different jumping tasks, which we again started in parallel and worked towards that turned out position. Um, everything we did that was sort of sport, sport specific, dance specific, we did in the clinic before we moved it to the studio. So the team knew she was in a safe, controlled environment and then she could take and safely participate with that within the studio. Something else we did, and it's not something I use routinely, but in this case, she had nothing happening in her VMO. I just could not get her VMO to fire at all. She was always using the outside of her quads. And I was looking at it and I said, I just don't want this to be a case of recurrent, um, recurrent, dis recurrent dislocations. So we actually worked on the seat of knee extension, adding a little bit of external rotation to fire VMO. From there, if I was to do this again, I'd get her into the hydro pool to do some hydrotherapy to introduce things earlier. I'd look at an activity diary, not so much to document pain, but to document her increase in activity so that she could see herself moving forwards. Um, in looking at going back to a full participation in dance, I'd, I'd be interested in exploring further dance-specific return to, return to dance tests, and I'd be interested to hear if anyone's got really good ones that they, that they like to use. Um, there is the Melbourne Return to Sport Test, which I like, however, I think it would be really interesting to see a more dance specific one. And it comes into the question of pre screening as to whether we could have reduced this from happening had she been adequately screened earlier. So, where we are now, she had a full return to all dancing with no feelings of instability, and she completed all her goals. She ended up getting the highest marks in her class for both her grade 7 and her intermediate exam, and she went and won a competition on there as well. So, she was pretty happy with the outcomes. She actually continued. Pilates exercise based treatment with me, or well, not treatment, more like um, prehab, I suppose, would be the word I'd use there, up until early this year, and every now and then we'll pop in for more kind of um, exploration on that. So, the take home messages from this would be we need to, when looking at the adolescent, consider their development and where things are at. While, by, while we put all these ideas onto load of biomechanics, we've also got to say, well, where is this person at on a development perspective? Um, we should consider the impact of the injury, both on the dancers themselves but also on their family, particularly for dancers who are still in that environment, and getting some of them back into the studio as soon as possible. It happens in sporting teams, they've got rehab programs there, but too often in, in sort of community dance, um, where they're not in a full-time program, it's very easy to say, let's give the dancers six weeks off and they don't go back to the studio and they switch off from it. Um, and to do that, though, we need to effectively communicate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one question, if somebody has a query for Danica. Great. That's a really good question, and I think one where there's a bit of research happening now, so I, I couldn't give you an exact answer on that. I think it depends largely on the individual, um, and because while we've got these kind of benchmarks, there is variability within people. Um, and I think as well, that's where, if we come to the biomechanics of the person and look at the load that's going into their body, that's where it could determine where that weakest link is. During puberty, there's a 
lot of weight things. I think 